Chapter 10. The journey back to England. Stowaway's Scottish Communist Party links up with English. Maclean's sickness and death. Communist Party organisation. Contests Dundee. Ireland betrayed. Jim Larkin. Germany, 1923. Crisis and betrayal. I saw Tanner, Ramsay and Sylvia off that evening, promising to meet them when I got back to London. But I was to see them very much sooner. The following morning a car came for me again. I was wanted at the Kremlin. This time I was ushered into Lenin's office. Very briskly he met me and shook hands, showed me to a seat, then said, without preliminaries, when can you go home? I told him I would not be leaving for some time yet, as I was going as a delegate to the Congress in Baku. No, no, he exclaimed. You must return to Britain as soon as possible. The workers have set up councils of action to stop Churchill's drive for war. You are needed at home. You can do more there than in Baku. Do you agree? What could I say other than that he was right and I ought to get home as soon as possible? When will you go? he asked next. I told him I had no packing to do and could go the next day. Why not tonight? Tonight, I exclaimed, but I could not get the necessary papers at such short notice. You agree to go, and I will see that you have all that is necessary, he assured me. Agreed, beaming on me, he shook hands and wished me well. And so back to the hotel to let John Reed know that he would have to get someone to take my place as his fellow delegate. Tom Quelch was chosen. Back in Britain, I got the tragic news that both of them returned to Moscow with typhoid. For John Reed, it proved fatal. Tom Quelch had a long illness, and I don't think he ever fully recovered. Lenin had suggested that in view of the many spies who were around, I should travel under an assumed name. So I took the name of John Thompson. My papers were first made out. And that evening, John Thompson boarded the train for Leningrad. The comrades there, having been advised by telephone, that they had to fix me up in the Hotel Europa. When I got to Leningrad, I found the three, the three from whom I had parted in Moscow. We agreed to travel together that evening. Once again, I went to Smolny for a talk with the leading comrades there. When having obtained my trap, train voucher, I paid a visit to a meeting of the Finnish Central Committee. I may have been the last foreign comrade to visit them. It was shortly after that some Finnish fascists, passing themselves off as Communist Party members, entered the headquarters and shot all the executive members present. A bad, bad business. We were driven to the station and shown our compartments. The three men were in one, and Sylvia had a compartment all to herself. The train started, and the four of us settled down for a chat about what we had seen and heard. We were soon disturbed, and I mean disturbed. The engine was burning logs of wood and was getting along quite nicely on that somewhat primitive fuel. We were feeling quite satisfied with things when the control came to examine our train vouchers and identity papers. The others were all right. But I was all wrong. I had handed over identity papers made out to John Thompson and a railway voucher made out to William Gallagher. One comrade in Moscow had made out my papers and another, evidently, had telephoned Leningrad to say that Gallagher was on his way and to make him out a ticket for Murmansk. We tried in a sort of chorus to make the guard understand. Other passengers gathered in the corridor. One of them spoke English and wanted to help, but we managed to edge him out and get the compartment door closed while we made the guard understand that we wanted him to telephone Leningrad at the next station. This he ultimately agreed to do. Having got this arranged, Sylvia went to her own compartment and the rest of us settled down to woo our friend Morpheus. But if we slept, it was not for long. At about two in the morning we woke, choking. The compartment was filling up with harsh, penetrating smoke. We threw open the door and found the corridor filled with it. 
The front corner of the carriage was on fire. We were not alone in being roused. The attendant had wakened and signalled to the engineman, and the train was stopped. We went out of the carriage in record time, but Sylvia, I went back and found her nearly suffocated. I raised her over my shoulder and got her outside, where she quickly recovered. The fire was soon extinguished, and we got on our way again. But there wasn't much sleep, although there was a large balloon-shaped net attached to the funnel of the engine, red-hot ashes still made their way through, and we didn't know when we might have to jump out again. However, the guard got satisfaction from Leningrad about my papers. We had no further fires and arrived safe and sound at Murmansk. It was now late August, and there was no more round-the-clock daylight in the Arctic. Little knowing what lay ahead, we boarded a fishing boat for Vardo. We set off in the afternoon in a choppy sea. By night time, the little craft was almost turning somersaults. We were down in the forward cubbyhole. Sylvia could not stand the confined space and the strong odour that clogs the air in such vessels. She wanted out on deck, and I had to go with her. The seas were dashing across the deck, but she wouldn't stay inside. I got a tarpaulin from one of the fishermen, got Sylvia to lie along the hatchway, and covered her with the tarpaulin. I wedged myself between the hatchway and the beam, and held her there all through the night, the sea behaving worse with every passing hour. What a night! I had been in several rough seas in the Atlantic, but that little craft got a buffeting worse than anything I had experienced before. It got so bad, the skipper took what must have been a desperate chance. We were running head on, and after a particularly heavy sea, he swung the little craft around. He was certainly high skilled. Had we caught the next one? On the beam, it might have been all over with us. But he made it, and we ran with the sea towards the shore into a cove where the water was calm and quiet. This would be about seven o'clock in the morning. The skipper knew where he was making for. There, on top of a rising piece of ground, was a Soviet wireless station. We made our way up to it and got a cordial welcome from the staff. They made us coffee, or rather, it was a substitute, but it was wet and hot and just what we needed. They heated up some potatoes, mashed them and mixed them with chopped bully beef. We told them it tasted good. They said we should thank Ironside when we got back home. <laughs> they were still living partly on the rations that General Ironside had left behind. It was a pleasant change to sit and chat with no wild sea jumping at us. We dozed a bit, for we had had no sleep all night. When we came off the boat, I could scrape the brain off my face, and of course I was soaked right through. Sylvia had come through it very well, and though, like the rest of us, she had got badly shaken. She wasn't long in getting back to her old lively self with the staff at the station. And maybe she had forgotten that while I was holding her on the hatchway, her mind had gone away back to her childhood days in the English countryside. She had started reciting what was, I expect, a folk ballad. Something about getting caught in a storm and about the old oak tree that sheltered me. From under the tarpaulin she had peeped out and, dis and declaimed, Gallagher, you're my oak tree. In the evening we set off again. The skipper thought the sea had fallen a bit. If it had, it wasn't long till it was up on its feet again. I must honestly say that it seemed worse than the night before, and the old oak tree had to function once again. In the early morning, the captain took another chance, and on this occasion ran us into the harbour of a village called Via de Guba. Sylvia was taken to a house on one side of the harbour, and the rest of us got a room across the other side. It was decided that we should spend the night there and make another try in the morning. 
We were fairly comfortable and we got enough to eat. Ramsay and Tanner occupied the only bed while I made myself comfortable on the floor and enjoyed a much needed sleep. In the morning after a cup of coffee and a piece of black bread, I went across to let Sylvia know that the boat was ready to leave. The woman who had came to the door looked at me in surprise when I asked for Sylvia. She waved her arm towards the mouth of the harbour and I gathered indicated that Sylvia had gone. I couldn't understand it. I went back to the other side and spoke to the skipper, who knew a bit of English, asking him if he knew what had happened. You could have knocked me down with a 12 pound hammer when he told me that she had gone with a Soviet trader that had been lying over on her side of the harbour. The names we called her when I reported to the others. To slip off like that, without a word, there's gratitude. There was nothing we could do about it but get aboard our own craft and hope for the best. Well, it is always permissible to hope, but we don't always get what we hope for, and we most surely didn't get it on this occasion. That night, so help me, was worse than the two previous nights put together. During the worst of it, Ramsay, Tanner and I solemnly shook hands and prepared to meet our doom. When at last we did get to Vardo, the first thing we did was to send a cable to Moscow recommending that no more delegates should be sent by the Arctic route. Alas, before Moscow could get through to Murmansk, another fishing boat had left. On board were three fishermen, a young French comrade named Lefebvre and another French delegate. The five of them were never heard of again. A sad, sad tragedy. After a day's wait, we were put onto a Norwegian passenger boat. We had fine Norwegian names, but there wasn't a very keen lookout kept by the Norwegian police, or we would easily have been spotted. We heard a stewardess telling some of our passengers that though we had Norwegian names, we did not know a word of Norwegian, although that was true. We had very difficult. We had very little difficulty in making out what she was saying to the others. However, we got to Tromso, where we disembarked without incident, and from there we got a night train for Christiana, now Oslo. Before seven and eight in the morning, we stopped at a station, the name of which I can't recall. Where there was a station restaurant such as I had never seen before. The passengers entered the door and paid the equivalent of four shillings. Inside, waiters were busy laying steaming platters on a series of tables. Eggs, fried, boiled and scrambled. All kinds of meat, hot and cold, fish, fruit, everything the heart or stomach of a man could desire. Plate after plate if you wished to play the glutton washed down by unlimited cups of coffee. Dissatisfied, the fed, not up but well, passengers returned to the train. We found Oslo an interesting city, with quite a brisk trade with, uh, quite a brisk trade at the harbour. The, the day following our arrival, a message came from the comrades in Bergen to the comrades in Oslo. Sylvia Pankhurst wants Gallagher to come immediately to Bergen. Serious trouble. For Christ's sake, I appealed to the others. What can it be now? It was a laugh to them, but not to me. The comrades insisted that I should go. They took me to the station, where strangely enough the assistant station master was a Dundee man. Bought me a ticket and saw me on to the train. I was met at Bergen and received the trouble and received the welcome news that Sylvia was aboard a ship and on her way home. The trouble? One of the comrades had helped her to slip aboard a ship the evening before we got her message. Once aboard, a seaman had tried to do her wrong and she had rushed off the ship screaming, made her way to the Communist Party headquarters and told them, somewhat hysterically, that she wanted Gallagher. Then, 
While I was travelling, they had got her into the hands of a good party comrade who was a trusted seaman and promised to take good care of her. So off she went with never another thought for me and my wasted journey. But I found out I found a couple of other helpless creatures at Bergen. Eamon McAlpin, the Irish American, and Roddy Connolly. When the Bergen comrades wired for me, they had made arrangements to get me stowed away on a ship that was sailing in a couple of days, on which there were several party members who would see that I was fixed up in comfort and got an occasional bite to eat. But this couple begged me to take them along. There was no chance of free getting into a comfortable corner, and I told them it would be much better for them to try separately. But no, they wanted to have my company. After a while, I agreed. I had a talk with one of the seamen comrades and explained how I was fixed. He said that if there were three of us, we would have to be slipped down below into the coal bunker by the top manhole. I broke the news to my new problems, <laughs> and they said they didn't care how they travelled if I was with them. So the coal bunker was agreed. On the afternoon of the night we had to get aboard, we collected our provisions, a loaf apiece and a five-gill bottle of water. That had to do us two nights and two days. Late in the evening, before the officers and crew were due to come aboard, we were down at the dock, waiting until the watchman was up at the forward end of the ship. We slipped on and made our way to the stokehold. One after another we got through the top manhole and made ourselves comfortable, if it's permissible to use that word, spread out over the coal. The ship was due to sail around midnight, and we held our breath till we heard the engines throb and all the rushing about overhead that indicated we were on our way. It was, of course, pitch dark in our bedroom. We were lying with our heads to the after end of the bunker, with our feet towards the manhole. The firemen in the stokehold were busily engaged, shoveling coal from the lower manhole into the furnaces. As time and their work went on, the coal moved away from our feet and legs, and soon there was a coal slide and we went slivering down with it. We then had to grope around, levelling out as best we could. As the height of the coal was reduced, odd lumps were left in the upper girders, and as the ship rolled, these came rattling down on the heads and bodies of the unfortunate passengers. Not only that, when we tore off a chunk of bread, we had to accept a relish of coal dust with it, and pick little gritty bits out of our teeth. It is not a mode of travel I would recommend. However, we got to Newcastle around midnight of the second day. I slipped up the companionway when all was quiet to look out for the watchman. When the coast was clear, I gave my two mates the glad sign, and we got off the ship in a hurry. Black as sweeps, we made our way along the dock. Before we had gone far, we met a policeman, and before he could stop us, I hailed him. I pitched a story of a breakdown in the engine, and how we had been sent home without thought as to where we could spend the rest of the night, for we lived outside the city. He was quite sympathetic and directed us to a Salvation Army lodging house, I think, in Pilgrim Street. When we got there, we found one of those concertina gates closed and locked, but there was a half glass door beyond and a bright light was shining through. With keen anticipation, I rang the bell. A surly looking lad came out towards the gate and gave us a hard look. He was no Samaritan. He simply refused to admit us. We must have looked really villainous. We tried all the arts of persuasion, but it was no use. He just turned and went back, leaving us there on the outside. We made our way to Market Street 
and got admitted to a small hotel where, in the basement, we got ourselves stripped, washed and, after cleaning our clothes as far as we could, went upstairs. Here we got a pot of tea and what goes with it. That was a feast, that was. Try it sometime. A diet of bread and coal for two days and two nights, and you'll know what it is to enjoy a meal. After resting a bit, we went to the station where we parted. They were off to Edinburgh, I to Glasgow. At the central station in Glasgow, I got a train for Paisley, where I found sad news waiting for me. My oldest sister, very dear she was, had died while I was away. It was unexpected in a way. I had known for some time that she had not been well. Her illness had taken a serious turn and she was taken to hospital for an operation. She came through the operation and lived for several days. My brother-in-law had spent most of his time at the hospital. She had been his boyhood sweetheart and he had been devoted to her. As he sat by her bedside, she would whisper, Is Willie no back yet? When I heard that and thought of her lying there waiting for me, I couldn't keep the tears from my eyes. It was my own Jean who broke the news to me. She understood and was very gentle and understanding. She had also been very fond of my sister Flora. That evening, we went to see my brother-in-law, who was left with two sons and a daughter. The following morning, Jean gave me another piece of news. One of the lads had come down from Glasgow to find out when I was likely to be home. It was before she had received my telegram, so she could not tell him. But he had let her know that a conference was being held on the following Saturday afternoon in the City Hall for the purpose of setting up a Communist Party independent of the party formed in London. This was startling news and it was meant I would have to be there and try to swing them over in favour of uniting with the party already formed. When I got there, I learned that John McLean and his followers, some members of the ILP and what was left of the Socialist Labour Party, were all represented. One of the SLP group objected to my being allowed to attend as I was not a delegate. The chairman was an old friend and he ruled otherwise. He said I would always be welcomed at a working class meeting. There was a short bit of wrangle and the chairman, Jack Lecky, put it to a vote. It was carried by a large majority that I stay and have the right to speak. John McLean was not present, but his lieutenant, James McDougall, was representing him and he voted against my presence. Speaking on behalf of John McLean, McDougall declared himself all in favour of a separate party. The SLP group made speeches to the same effect. After a time, I asked the chairman to give me the floor. I reminded them that the unity of the working class was something we had all earnestly advocated, that only through unity could we ever hope to make progress. True. It had to be unity based on a sound Marxist policy and programme, but had any of the speakers here who were advocating not unity but division, had they said anything against the policy and programme of the party already formed? Not one had done so. Apparently, they did not like some of the members of the new party as persons. At any rate, that seemed to be the burden of their arguments. I appealed to them, not to go ahead with their separate party, but to appoint a committee to get in touch with the leaders of the new party, to get from them a clear statement of their policy, come back to another conference and make a report on the basis of which they could decide what to do. The chairman said that this was a wise suggestion and counselled the delegates to accept it. Despite protests from the opponents, a committee was elected. I could not be a member of it because I was not a delegate, of, a delegate to the meeting. But Jack got over that by proposing that the committee should be given power to co-opt me. This was also agreed 
much to the disgust of MacDougall and the remnants of the SLP. The committee got in touch with the new party, and out of the negotiations and a further conference, it was decided to hold a unity conference in Leeds, at which all official positions would be thrown open for election. Arthur McManus had already been chosen as president of the new party, and that position, with the others, was open to be challenged. Jack wanted me to stand for president. I was against it. The new party would have a majority of delegates at the Unity Conference, and they would undoubtedly vote for their own already chosen president. Moreover, I had recollections of our comradeship during the first years of the war, and I had no desire to give the impression by standing against Arthur that I had no confidence in him as a leading official of the party. There was a further drawback, which I didn't mention. Anyone who stood for the position of president could not be nominated for the executive, so I held back. But Jack and the other Scottish comrades were adamant. I must stand. I let them put my name forward. And, as I had expected, all the Glasgow delegates voted for me and all the others voted for Little Mac, as he was familiarly known. So President and Executive were elected, and I remained a member of what at that time we called the rank and file. The following week, I made a point of seeing and talking to John McLean when I told him that Lennon had expressed a very strong desire to see him. John knew that his work was well known in the young Soviet Republic. He had been appointed consul for Scotland, and one of the docks in Leningrad had been given the name of John McLean Dock. Quite apart from the message I had brought from Lennon, he appeared keen to make the trip. He had certain commitments to fulfil, but assured me he would not take on any more when they were concluded he would make the journey to Moscow. I was very happy at the outcome of this task, and despite his anger at what had happened with regard to the separate party, we were on the friendliest possible terms. About a month later, I learned that he had decided not to go to the Soviet Union. I went to see him again in the Ingram Street Hall, where he was using a room as headquarters of what he'd called the Tramp Trust but afterwards changed to the Scottish Communist Republican Party. I found him in the company of an ex-policeman from Dundee, Sandy Ross. This fellow was one of a number of harpies who were clinging like parasites to John. Up to the last, John got mass support from the working class and, with his public meetings and Marxist classes, he drew in sufficient money to maintain this ex-policeman and something to spare for two or three others. Strange that with his obsession about spies, he should have such a questionable customer as his constant companion. I tried my best to get John to keep the promise he had made me. How do I know that what you told me about Lenin is true, he said. Why are you so anxious to get me away from Scotland? I gazed at him astonished. Has someone been suggesting that I want you out of the country? I asked. His eyes shifted. He, uh, he shifted his eyes to Sandy Ross. You big white livered bugger, I said to that subject. Is this some of your work? I had nothing to do with it, he muttered. One thing led to another, and at last I found that a prominent member of the SLP had told John that I was jealous of the standing he had with the working class and wanted him out of Glasgow. I was mad, blazing mad. When I got home, I made a very bad blunder, one of many of which I have been guilty on occasions. I wrote a letter. I marked it private and confidential and sent it to the secretary of the SLP, a lad called Mitchell, asking him to put it before his executive. I explained what had taken place between John and myself when he agreed to go to Moscow 
and how a prominent member of the SLP had succeeded in getting John to call off the visit by telling him that I was jealous of him. A very silly statement, and one that would have had no effect on and one that would have had no effect if John had not been a sick man. I went on to say that this was a very serious matter, that John was suffering from hallucinations, and if he didn't receive treatment, it could mean the end of him as a working class agitator and teacher. I pointed out that he would get the treatment he required in Moscow, and it was criminal on the part of one of their members, whom I named, to stand in this in his way. That's roughly what I wrote. What happened? Mitchell telephoned the lad who was doing the dirty work, read the letter out to him, and asked him what he should do. Make copies, was the answer he got, and give one to John McLean. How do I know this? The following Sunday evening, at a packed meeting in St Mungo's Hall, John told his audience, Gallagher is trying to make out that I am mad. He wants to get me in an asylum. He produced a copy of the letter, told how it came into his possession, and read it out then and there. What comrades? And poor John did not realise how rotten they were, that they could play such a dastardly trick not on me but on him. As sure as I write this, they killed him. The remnant of the SLP, without a future, thought maybe they could get a blood transfusion through association with John's Scottish Republican Party. A conference was arranged between them. It was arranged for a Saturday afternoon in the SLP Hall in Renfrew Street. I told my friend Sterling I was going to force my way in and challenge them about my letter and the sickness of John McLean. He said he would like to come with me. I told him there was a chance that I would get thrown out. All right, he grinned. I'll be there to catch you. The two of us went to Glasgow and made our way to Renfrew Street. The SLP hall was L-shaped. The door opened at the toe of the short leg of the L. The platform was at the corner looking into the long leg, which of course could not be seen from the door. I opened the door and pushed in. Pushed in is correct, for all the seats were occupied and a whole number of people were standing in the entrance. When Sterling and I appeared, there was a sort of hushed gasp. The chairman, James McDougall, could hardly believe his eyes. He glared at me for several seconds and shouted, What do you want here? I want to make a short talk about a letter I wrote and about comrade John McLean, was my reply. You'll make no talk here, he was still shouting. Get out! After I make the talk, I responded. If you don't go out, you'll get thrown out, he threatened, looking towards the ex-policeman who was standing near the door. There's no use looking at Sandy Ross, I told him. The other day, in the presence of John, I called him a white-livered bugger, and that's what he is, didn't I, Sandy? He mumbled something like, No, you didn't. Well, I'm telling you now, I said. All this time, John McLean kept repeating, Gallagher, you're a waster. Gallagher, you're a waster. Then I heard someone from the long leg of the hall addressing the chairman. I had no idea who it was, but a very clear voice said, Mr. Chairman, I think we should hear what Comrade Gallagher has to say. The chairman gazed in that direction, as if he could not believe his ears. Then, as if speaking more to himself than to the lad who had made the remark, he muttered, You bugger, you're another of them. I got the opportunity and said a few words about the shocking action of the official who had given my letter to McLean about McLean's promise and how he had been persuaded to go back on it. I warned them that they were endangering the health of our comrade and appealed to all those present who had any real regard for McLean to stop the harpies exploiting him and let him get a chance to have a rest. But they kept him at it. 
Towards the end, his voice gave way, and he could only force out a hoarse creak. A bit like me just now after talking for an hour. In the winter of 1923, he was laid low with pneumonia. Not quite sure the time difference between these events in 1923. Um, maybe a year or two. In the winter of 1923, he was laid low with pneumonia. In his weak, exhausted condition, he was unable to combat it, and after a few weeks of suffering, he closed his eyes on the world and its trials. What of the harpies? Shortly after John's death, the ex-policeman got a post in India as a foreman or policeman in an Indian mill. The lad who advised Mitchell to give John a copy of my letter joined the Labour Party and throve exceedingly. The lad who made the interjection in my favour at the Renfrew Street meeting, I learned afterwards, was Aitken Ferguson, a member of the SLP. Some time later, I was introduced to him by a friend. He joined the Communist Party and we've been close friends and comrades for all the years that have followed. All my Glasgow comrades knew that Wednesday forenoon, every week is set aside for a visit to Aitken. He knows my weakness for writing letters, and often he will tell me that I ought to write this, write to this paper or that, and what I should say. Dutifully, I carry out his instructions. Occasionally, a letter gets published, but my, oh my, the letters I have written that have never made the columns of our great free press. Although I was not an official of the Communist Party, I was a very busy man, meeting, meetings all over the country, street meetings, indoor meetings, mass meetings and small meetings. I'm certain that no one in this or any other country could beat my record for public meetings and street demonstrations. Of course, there were many other comrades participating in the organisational and propaganda work. But despite the devotion of many good men and women, the party was not flourishing. Things, in fact, were quite otherwise. The revolutionary tide that had arisen on the continent had had a big effect in this country, so much so that the Labour Party executive published a document, Labour and the New Social Order, in which we were told, Labour, whether in office or in opposition, will do nothing to help in the restoration of capitalism, but will do all in its power to bury it with the millions it has done to death. The Labour Party had also, for the first time, set the goal of socialism as its aim. But by 1921, the tide was showing signs of ebbing. On the main hoardings of the country could be seen appeals with pictures of Labour leaders who had already forgotten their own document and were loyal to the bourgeoisie, urging the workers to work harder and produce more. Our party was likewise feeling the effect of the receding tide. Many enthusiasts who, like the wealthy people of the year 1000, when it was prophesied, when it was prophesied that the balloon would go up, and the elect would go with it, had poured a goodly portion of their wealth into the coffers of the party, were now falling off. Others who had expected spectacular things to happen with the formation of the party began to drift away from it. The situation was giving concern to the leadership. At an executive meeting, it was suggested that my experience of the ups and downs of movements might be helpful, and it was decided to co-opt me onto the executive as vice president, with power to make recommendations for stopping the decline and for getting the party on the upward path once again. As I found out very early, I had taken on a tough job. Not only was the membership at a very low ebb, the financial situation was extremely threatening too. 
It was obvious that several full-time functionaries would have to go and find a livelihood elsewhere. It would scarcely be worthwhile to list all the organisational changes that were made, for it may be mentioned that I set up two committees in an effort to draw all members of the party into its work. I set up what were known as the Organisational and Political Subcommittees. These became recognised organs of the party. As for finance, I proposed the cutting down of expenses in varying various ways, including head office and district office expenditure. Several sackings had to be made, of which I will mention only one, because of a sequel that will be that will be mentioned later. I sacked Jack Braddock, Bessie's husband, and how I wish I had kept the correspondence that passed between us, like so much else it has gone. It was drawing towards the autumn of 1921 when I became vice president. I found that I was just in time to go with a delegation of Communist Party leaders to meet a delegation from the Labour Party executive to discuss our application for affiliation. Our delegation consisted of Albert Inkpin, secretary, Arthur McManus, president, Tom Bell, national organiser, and myself, the newly appointed vice president, representing the Labour Party, were Sidney Webb, Philip Snowden, Arthur Henderson, and the national agent, Egerton P. Wake. It was decided that I should put the case for the Communist Party. I thought the president ought to open, but he and the others were against us. I wondered about it at the time, and we weren't long in the joint session before I found the reason for it. I thought I had made out a good case for our affiliation, and I certainly got a cur courteous hearing. But no sooner had I finished than Sidney Webb got a press cutting from among his papers and said to me, you have made out a very good case for affiliation. Now tell us what this means. And he handed me the cutting. It was from our party's weekly paper. And the date was a week after party's formation in the previous August, while I had been in Moscow. I was completely knocked off my balance when I read it, though I tried not to show it. It was a very short note, written by McManus, to reassure those members of the SLP whom he had been able to bring with him into the new organisation, all of whom had throughout the conference remained firmly opposed to affiliation. He told them they had nothing to fear, that our application for affiliation was being made so that we could disrupt the Labour Party from within. Talk about fighting a losing battle. We were rooted before we met in conflict. I tried my best, but they always returned to the question of loyalty, in relation to which they could put no trust in us. I waxed wroth at this, addressing myself to Snowden. How can you raise the question of loyalty with us? I asked him. I was loyal to the movement when many of you, when many of those you are associated with with now had gone over to the enemy. You were in Glasgow when I was out on bail, and you warmly congratulated me. Isn't that so? He agreed, and said that he would take none of it back. He would welcome me and others of our par and others of our members into the Labour Party, but not the Communist Party itself. The party could only hope to gain its aims by disrupting the Labour Party. And we couldn't get past that. We were solidly against affiliation. At the subsequent St Pancras Congress of our party, our late and ever revered comrade Tommy Jackson inadvertently gave our enemies a further opportunity of misrepresenting the party's policy. In answer to a question someone had put to him about shaking hands with Arthur Henderson, one of the men responsible for the shooting of James Connolly, he made the typical Jacksonian remark. 
Yes, I'd take him by the hand as a preliminary to taking him by the throat. For years that was presented on the platform and in the press as the Communist Party has openly declared that it would only shake hands with the Labour Party as a preliminary to taking it by the throat. This distorted version was spread so rapidly and continuously that it was impossible for us with our limited means to overcome it, and so the membership of the Labour Party got an entirely wrong impression of our party and its policy. At this, at this same Congress, which was held in March 1922, the Executive proposed that a commission of 8 EC, Executive Committee, I think that is, 8 EC members should be set up to go into the whole question of party organisation, including finance, policy and leadership. An amendment was moved and carried against the EC by 87 to 38. That the Commission should consist of non-EC members. This represented a victory for those who at that time regarded themselves as the constructive opposition. I was eventually decided, it was eventually decided that a three-man commission was adequate, and I was very strong in demanding that R. Pam Dutt, the young student I had met at Guildford, should be its chairman. Having achieved this, I was quite satisfied that the other two should be Harry Inkpin, brother of the party secretary, and a fine young chap, and a young comrade Harry Pollitt, who had come from Manchester to work in London. The commission did a great job for the party. Comrade Dutt was obviously the guiding and directing force in its work and achievements. The report presented for discussion gave all of us, whether in the country or at headquarters, a clear idea of how a Marxist Communist Party should organise and carry on its work and the correct Marxist policy on which that work should be based. The report didn't immediately solve the problems of finance and membership, but it started us on the way to solve them. In the meantime, there was an election coming on, and I had been chosen to contest Dundee as Communist Party candidate. Dundee was a single constituency with two representatives, Churchill, at time was one. I cannot recall the other. Labour put up Tom Johnson and though not openly making a pact, I encouraged their supporters to give their other vote to Eddie Scrimgeour, the prohibitionist. Eddie had stood on several previous occasions and this time there was an amazing sweep of sentiment around the slogan which could be seen and heard all over Dundee. Give old Eddie a chance. And by God, it got old Eddie the votes. By God is correct if we were to believe old Eddie. At the declaration of the poll, it was to God, not to the electors, that he rendered thanks. Eddie and God were an un beatable combination while the sentiment lasted. We were a terrific campaign nevertheless, directing all our fire against Churchill. I had a great band of workers, most of them, like Eddie, prohibitionists. There had been a split in the ranks of the prohibition movement some time before. Bob Stewart was the leader of a group that wanted socialism to be made the goal of the movement. Scrimgeour's social program, if it could be caught if such it could be called, was pie in the sky. On this the split took place and the socialist prohibitionists prohibitionists, led by Bob Stewart who had a good knowledge of Marxism, joined in the unity negotiations that led to the formation of the Communist Party. As a branch of the party, they were very active with the advantage of having a hall 
Not a very large one, but useful for all kinds of meetings. This hall was our centre in the election campaign, and it attracted many supporters outside the ranks of the party, in particular a small group of lads who were heart and soul with the IRA. We got tremendous meetings with ever-growing enthusiasm. Churchill's meetings, whether he was present or not, began, continued and ended in uproar, and in uproar could always be heard the accursed name Gallagher, never the name of any other candidate, how he must have hated the sound. When the tumult and the shouting died, we gathered in an upstairs room to hear the sheriff read out the results. At the window were the two victors, Eddie and Johnson. Between them and me sat Churchill and his wife. His face was drawn into a scowl and he kept pulling at his upper lip. His good lady was softly weeping. It was an awful blow for them. Old Eddie at the window scarcely bothered looking down at the crowd below. He gave most of his attention to his pal up above. Johnson then said a few words, after which the sheriff, half turning, said, Would you care to speak, Mr Churchill? Churchill, with his back to the sheriff, did not turn his head, just gave it a negative shake. Before the sheriff had a chance to close the proceedings, I called out, Hey, I'm going to speak. A sort of electric current appeared to animate Churchill. I thought he was going to get up. It was as if he was thinking, If that bastard can speak, there can be nothing to keep me from doing the same. But the current wasn't strong enough. He sank back, his scowl darker than before. Sixteen years later, when Tories, Liberals, Labour and ILPers were cheering Chamberlain and wishing him Godspeed in his treacherous pilgrimage to Munich, Churchill sat in his corner seat below the gangway, the only member beside myself who made it clear by his silence that he was against the betrayal of Czechoslovakia. Head lowered, he was scowling much as I had seen him scowl in Dun at Dundee. When I spoke, amid the jeers and yells of the Tories, I saw the electric current stir him again. That's twice I almost forced him to his feet, but the weight of Toryism on this occasion like the lack of it at the polls that other time, made his knees rubbery. I got over 6,000 votes in that election. There was another election within two years, and I stood again and got over 10,000. It was thought by the comrades that I was well on the way to win the seat. But new tasks had come on the scene for me, and to make clear what had happened, I will have to go back to early 1921. I was in jail when the Easter Rising of 1916 made its historic declaration establishing Ireland as an independent republic. The Clyde Workers Committee kept close in touch with the Irish movement. Several of our members having had a long association with James Connolly through the Socialist Labour Party. Then, when what de Valera called the Four Glorious Years started, we were ready to give our fullest support to the Sinn Féin government in the heroic fight it was making for an Ireland free and independent, one and indivisible. In all our campaigning on its behalf, we kept in close contact with the leaders in Dublin. We had two valuable contacts in Glasgow. Joe Robinson. We had two valuable contacts in Glasgow. Joe Robinson, whose brother was a, an officer in the IRA. And Charlie Diamond, 
who ultimately got arrested and deported to Ireland, only to have the deportation order withdrawn and compensation awarded to him when the treaty was signed. In November 1921, the Lloyd George government, realising that the strong feeling in this country and America would sooner or later overwhelm them if they continued their utterly ruthless and brutal war against an heroic people only asking to be free, decided to open up negotiations with President de Valera and the Irish government. De Valera who had £5,000 or £7,000 on his head, dead or alive, came to London and had a session or two with the tricky Welshman. But nothing Lloyd George could say or do could shake or change the Irish president. No allegiance to the crown, no partition. Ireland free and independent, one and indivisible. All the threats of an all-out terrible war made no impression on him. He and his government were bound not only to the living but to the dead. To face whatever perils might lay ahead to ensure the realisation of their centuries-old struggle. He went back to Dublin and reported what had taken place in London to prepare if necessary to face a further period of armed struggle. Then came the proposal for a conference couched in very ambiguous language from the British cabinet. In Dublin it was decided to send plenipotentiaries as it would be an advantage for the President of the Republic to remain in Ireland. The plenipotentiaries were Arthur Griffiths, Michael Collins, Robert Barton, Edmund Duggan and George Gavin Duffy. Also with them was Erskine Childers who, with a team of capable young journalists, was responsible for publicity. Before the treaty was actually signed, word of what was going on before the treaty was actually signed, word of what was going to happen was conveyed to me through one of the journalists. I immediately reported this to our party headquarters, and it was decided that I should take the night boat to Dublin and make contact with the Labour leaders and with the Defence Minister, Kaffel Brugge. This I arranged through Countess Markievicz, who had made occasional visits to my home in Paisley. I had no trouble in getting Tom Johnson, the leader of the Irish Labour Party, no connection with the woeful specimen in this country, <laughs> to agree to accompany me to a meeting with the Defence Minister. We got to the appointed meeting place. There were several other young officers with the Minister, the Minister of Labour and Countess Markovich. When I told them that a treaty involving partition had been drawn up and was ready for signature, they simply refused to believe it. The plenipotentiaries would never dare sign such a betrayal of what they had fought and hoped for. De Valera was in Galway, reviewing several regiments of the IRA, and he was as firm as ever for Ireland, one and indivisible. There in Galway, he was pledging his word that he and his government would be prepared to face a renewal of terrible war rather than yield on this great and inviolable principle. I could only keep on pressing them that they must believe it and decide what they were going to do. I told them that I had brought Tom Johnson along because a combination between Labour and Sinn Féin in such a situation as was about to arise was absolutely essential. Action was essential. I suggested that they should arrest Griffiths and Collins as soon as they landed and then issue a call to the people of Ireland to prepare for whatever might eventuate. But this would call for a declaration of policy. I asked the Defence Minister to give his consideration to a document I had prepared, setting out a programme for his government to follow in orders to make life better and brighter for the workers and small farmers. This was too much for Cattle Brugge. 
He was the Iron Man of the Republican government, and one of the most courageous, resolute fighters for Ireland I ever met. One look at his strong, sharp-featured face, and you knew that here was a man who would never yield in his devotion to the Irish cause. Ireland, one and indivisible, was engraved on his heart, and for Ireland he would live or die. Alas, he chose to die when he might have lived. He was a businessman and a Roman Catholic, two reasons for his antipathy to communism, in fact to anything of a radical character. In response to my suggestion, he said that I would always be welcome in Dublin, but not to try and get them to accept communism. I tried to show him the urgent necessity of making preparations for an entirely new situation, cooperation with Labour as represented by Johnson, and a programme that would make a broad appeal to the people of Ireland, would enable them to counter any move made by Griffiths and Collins. It wasn't enough to have guns, I told him. The man who understands politics will always have the advantage of the man who relies on guns alone. I pointed out that many people in Ireland were hoping for an end to the tragic years, and that the influential pro-British elements would play on this. Griffiths and Collins, if they were allowed to take over, would be very pleasant and accommodating until they had got themselves established. Then they would suppress all armed opposition. Countess Markovich told me I was talking utter nonsense, that Michael Collins would never turn against the men with whom he had fought side by side. To this, I replied that he had already turned against them by making a deal with Lloyd George and Churchill and that history had provided abundant evidence of such betrayals. Once again, I urged that the wise course would be to arrest the two of them when they landed in Dublin. To this, Cahill Brugge declared, I won't be the man responsible for shedding Irishman's blood. All right, I retorted. It will be the wrong Irishman's blood that will be spilt. A few more words and we parted, but not before an official messenger had arrived and whispered in Catalbruga's ear. He got up and nodded to his aides and they went off, they went hurrying off. It was obvious that Erskine Childers had got the tragic news across. Griffiths and Collins returned with the treaty that had been signed without reference to the President of the Republic, who had recognised that the two great principles that he and those close to him had always fought for had been thrown overboard in London, but instead of taking action against the perpetrators, de Valera issued a summons for a meeting of the Dáil to discuss the treaty. Deputy after deputy spoke, some for, some against. Two outstanding speeches were made, one by Liam Mellows and one by Harry Boland. But I will just give a quotation from the speech of Cattle Brugge, taken from the Four Glorious Years by David Hogan. Here, when we are so strong and England so weak with so many enemies as she has now, we are asked to do such a thing as this. Why, if instead of being so strong, our last cartridge has been fired, our last shilling has been spent, and our last man was lying on the ground and his enemies howling around him and their bayonets raised, ready to plunge them into his body, that man should say, true to the traditions handed down, if they said to him, now will you come into our empire, he should say, and he would say, no, I will not. And of, Dave, and of this David Hogan could say, I can hear again Cattle Brugge on this last day of the debate foretelling his own death. Yes, the last day of the debate and drawing nearer the last day of Cattle Brugge. 
where the debate ended with a vote of 64 for the treaty and 47 against. As David Hogan says, and within a very little time, more than four men who had voted for the treaty were back in the ranks of those who voted against it. A near thing, but near enough to put power into the hands of Griffiths and Collins. When the vote was declared, de Valera said a few words and then broke down and cried. He had reason to cry, for he had failed the Republic. The new government of the free state adopted a friendly, passive attitude towards the still remaining armed forces of the, of the IRA until it had built up its own armed forces. Then, urged on by its British overlords, it launched a full-scale attack on the four courts held by Rory O'Connor on the headquarters of Catalbrugge. Cattle and his lads held out until further resistance was useless. He ordered what was left of his forces to make their way out at the rear, where there was a good chance of escape. For himself, when they had gone, he went dashing out of the front door and fell under a hail of bullets. And there, in the dust of O'Connell Street, the great Irish patriot gasped out his last breath. Yes, de Valera had reason to weep. In April 1923, I went to Southampton to meet another great Irishman, Jim Larkin. Big Jim, as an agitator, was truly terrific. As Sean O'Casey says of him, he found the Dublin transport workers on their knees and aroused them to stand up on their feet. Their 1913 battle with Murphy and the other Dublin bosses is a magnificent episode in the history not only of the Dublin working class, but in view of the part played by the British working class movement, including the cooperatives of international solidarity. Big Jim, with James Connolly, had participated in building up the Irish Transport Workers' Union of which he became General Secretary. In 1914, he went to the United States on a fundraising tour and took an active part in the left socialist movement there. In 1919, when communists and lefts were being attacked, he was arrested, put on trial and sentenced to from five to ten years in Sing Sing. In 1923, he was set free and was deported to Britain. There were four of us at Southampton to receive him. Delia Lark and his sister, Daly of the Dublin Trades Council and Irish-American, now Australian, Eamon McAlpin, and myself. It was clear from his... It was clear from his conversation on the road to London that he was in a belligerent mood. He had no time for the gunmen, as he then and always referred to the sections of the IRA that were still carrying on the battle for the Republic against the Free State Government. And he was going to have something to say to and about the leaders of the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union. I tried to persuade him to let things rest for a time until he got a proper grasp of the changed situation, but he wouldn't listen. He knew what the situation was. He had been kept in touch with all that was going on, and now it was time to make a clean-up. When he got to Dublin, the working class turned out en masse to greet him. I don't suppose there was ever anything like it since the reception given to Parnell. Dublin was his, if only he had kept it so. Not long after his arrival, he made a speech in which he came out against the gunmen that alienated some of his followers. But the real storm arose in connection with the Union. He started out to clean it up, but ended by being expelled. 
The leader of the union, following the death of James Connolly, was Bill O'Brien, a very clever demagogue who could talk about and write about Connolly as though he were his devoted disciple, while he pursued a policy in complete contrast with the militant spirit that was common to both Connolly and Larkin. Between 1923 and 1927, I was a fairly regular visitor to Dublin, and Big Jim and I were very close friends and comrades in that period. He and his brother Peter had formed a new union, the Workers' Union of Ireland, with headquarters in Marlborough Street. Before his expulsion from the IT and GW, he and I and Madame Maud Gone McBride had addressed a mass meeting from the window of the union headquarters, Liberty Hall. It was the anniversary of the martyrdom of young Kevin Barry. Cosgrave was Prime Minister at the time, and Kevin's sister was in prison and had been taken from her cell to the prison hospital where she was seriously ill as a consequence of going on hunger strike. Following the meeting, we formed up and marched to St Kevin's Church, where a mass was being said for Kevin Barry. The demonstration packed the church, and Big Jim and I stood in the rear. Just before the service began, a side door near the altar opened, and who should come in but Cosgrove? With two members of his bodyguard, an indignant murmur swept over the church at this intrusion, as it was referred to afterwards especially as it was his government that was holding Kathleen Barry in jail. But Big Jim was now banned from Liberty Hall by a court order. His new headquarters were opposite the pro-cathedral, and I used to be amused when a bunch of Jim's members coming straight over from the church would accost me at the entrance and would tell me in very undevout language, what they thought about the bosses, with an occasional crack about old Bill O'Brien. I went to see Bill once or twice in the hope of being able to patch th things up between him and Big Jim, but I couldn't get anywhere. Old Bill had been a very able lieutenant, but I couldn't get anywhere. Old Bill had a very able lieutenant called Cattell O'Shannon, who had been in the Citizens Army and fought with Connolly in the last stand at the post office. Very cynical he was about the big fella. He comes back here thinking he's a hero, was his caustic comment. He forgets that while he was away there was an Irish hero behind every bush. I brushed that aside. It might be very clever, but it was not very helpful. Don't forget, I pointed out, that it was Larkin who inspired the workers and made the Transport Workers Union a reality. Whatever you may say now, you are benefiting from the invaluable service he gave before he went to America. There might be something in that, he agreed, but the fact that he had been there at the start of the union did not necessarily mean that he should, they should allow him to destroy it. that they could not be moved. Of course, Big Jim was a difficult man to work with. He couldn't bear contradiction and did not hesitate to browbeat any incipient opposition. He was a powerful figure of a man, toppling six feet, strong of build, with a lion-like head and a voice that could be as gentle as a dove's, or if need be, as loud as the lion's roar. 
He was a passionate speaker. He knew poverty and hardship, and he hated those responsible for it. He was, in that sense, the voice of the insurgent working class. And while I would class him among the great agitator, the greatest agitators I ever heard, I couldn't say the same for him as a propagandist. Like speech, speakers such as A.J. Cook and Jimmy Maxton, he never prepared a speech, and his lack of preparation often led him into contradictions that were difficult to get over. An outstanding example of this I recall when he was standing as a candidate for the Doll in 1927. I was over for the whole of the campaign and with his brother Peter was kept extremely busy <coughs> during the troubles proclamations were regularly issued from Westminster through Dublin Castle and we therefore decided to issue a proclamation of our own it was a dandy and wherever it was posted attracted a great number of interested readers it proclaimed what Big Jim was going to do if he was returned to the doll. In large type, in the centre of the proclamation, was the promise immediately to demand the repeal of the Public Security Act that had been pushed through by the Cosgrove government, an oppressive act as bad as the worst coercion act ever used by the British occupation against the people of Ireland. One evening, we had a monster meeting on the far side of the Liffey. Jim got going first, Jesus, but he had his audience enthralled. At his hearers, as his hearers got worked up, so did he, until he declared in a passion of eloquence, we are not complaining about the Public Security Act, we welcome it, we'll see this at boomerangs. When we get power, as get it we will, it will become the weapon for crushing those who have exploited and oppressed us for so long. That's what he drove home, and by lord they cheered him. Pete and I could only look at one another and shrug our shoulders. That was Big Jim. He always had the audience with him even when he was contradicting his own policy. Big Jim got elected, but he was not allowed to take his seat as he had been declared bankrupt following a libel case, which he lost, brought against him by the Irish Labour leader Tom Johnson. A few years later, he and his young son Jim were both elected. But back in 1923, after seeing Big Jim off to Dublin, I got ready for a visit to Moscow. Jean came with me. I could only remain there for a very short time as I had to go on to Germany to address a series of meetings there. Jean, after travelling so far, decided that she would remain for a bit. She had become friendly with Anna Louise Strong and some of the other occupants of the Lux Hotel where we had been provided with a room. There was a communal kitchen in the Lux and residents brought their own food and in most cases did their own cooking. Jean had no trouble with the shopping. She had a very keen ear and quickly picked up sufficient words to enable her to get her groceries and other supplies. I left Jean quite happy in Moscow and returned to London in time for a meeting of the party executive where decisions were taken to put into effect the proposals on organisation of our Pam Dutt's mission adopted at the previous party congress and I went north to speak at several meetings in Lanarkshire where our lads were having a ding-dong battle with the old guard in the Lanarkshire Miners Union. From there I went back to London and thence to Berlin. The situation in Germany in 1923 was appalling. Day by day the value of the mark went down. When a worker got his wages he had to spend them without delay. If anyone was foolish enough to hold on to his money, he would be lucky if the following day, if he had lost only half of it. A million marks for a box of matches. Soon a million mark note was being kept as a souvenir. Our party was very active and was attracting greater and greater support. Our meetings, wherever they were held, were always packed out with many disappointed people outside. 
I spoke at a terrific demonstration in Berlin with a communist Reichstag representative as my interpreter, and he could certainly put it across. Whether or not he was always accurate was a question that did not arise until we got to Cologne. Before that, I was in the Ruhr, which was then under French and Belgian occupation. I spoke in several Ruhr towns, including Essen, but when I spoke at Hamborn, the platform room was suddenly invaded by a group of French and Belgian security officers. They told me I was under arrest and demanded my passport. I was hand- As I was handing it over, the German comrades started to crowd in on the invaders, shouting all sorts of protests and acting in a very threatening manner. The security men started jabbering excitedly and attention was momentarily turned from the victim who was the very who was very efficiently removed from the scene. Out of a back door I went onto the pillion of a motorcycle and whoosh through a dark wet night out of Hamborn to an unknown destination. Not until we had travelled many miles and drawn up at a darkened house in a dark street did I get a chance to see the size and shape of my rescuer. He had looked a likely lad in the dark, and when I got in the house, through a dark room to a little kitchen at the back where the light was on, I saw a tall young lad with a fair, smiling face, who was happy to introduce me to his lovely young wife. He gave her what was obviously a graphic description of what had happened. Her eyes were quite round as she listened. When he had finished, she shook hands with me again. I responded by shaking her husband's hand and trying to convey to her that he was the one to be congratulated. Neither of them knew a word of English, and I knew only a word or two of German, which I pronounced very badly, but after she had made a pot of ersatz coffee, we managed with the aid of gestures and hieroglyphics to carry on a sort of conversation. At bedtime, the young lad led me into the front room, which contained a very large double bed. He stripped and I stripped. He invited me to occupy the far side of the bed. Then he got in beside me. The young wife came in, opened a drawer, and took out a nightdress. I wondered where she was going to sleep, for there was no other accommodation apart from the small kitchen. A few minutes later, she came into the bedroom, put out the light, and got in beside her husband. That was the first experience I ever had of sharing a bed with husband and wife. In the morning she was first up, and by the time we were dressed she had our breakfast prepared. The same ersatz coffee, the same black bread and substitute margarine that we had had the evening before. Terrible, the privation that was inflicted on a working class. Yet in Berlin we saw the usual squander mania in the west part of the city, that can be seen today. After thanking these hospitable young comrades and leaving them an English one-pound note which they could hold on until something special cropped up, I got to the station and set off for Cologne. This area of Germany was under the control of the British, and I had gathered from the German comrades that they got on better with the British than with the French. Nevertheless, I got a surprise when I entered the platform room of the hall where I was to speak. There were two British security officers there. What's all this we have been hearing? One of them asked me. I told him that I had had my passport taken away in Hamborn and had been threatened with arrest. They're going too bloody far, he said to my utter astonishment. Something will have to be done about it. Never you trouble, we'll get your passport back. I gasped. I thought you were here with similar intentions, I said, hardly able to believe my ears. Not at all, he assured me. We're here to see that the people are properly treated, and we're not going to tolerate any bullying. I hope you have a successful meeting. If you find this hard to believe, wait till you hear what happened at the meeting itself. I can only tell it as it happened. 
The security man came on to the platform with me, and it was the usual packed, enthusiastic meeting. When I finished my speech with a call to the German, French and British workers to unite and use their mighty strength to defeat their imperialist oppressors, there was a tremendous cheer, although I spoke in English, or as near English as I can get. They were able to grasp what I had been proposing and reacted accordingly. This seemed to inspire my interpreter, for on this occasion he excelled himself and soon had the audience raising the roof. But as they cheered and cheered again, they noticed that one of the officers was on his feet. The cheering died into a silence that could be felt. There he stood, a typical self-assured British officer. In the silence, he told the interpreter that he had wrongly represented my closing words. Mr. Gallagher did not use the word insurrection, he said, and you must make this clear to the audience. As he was speaking in German, the audience already heard it, and the interpreter could only confirm what the officer had heard. When we moved from the platform, I asked him why he had done what he did. He assured me that he regretted having to interfere, but that they would have to make a report, and they did not want any stories going around that I had been shouting for insurrection, as such language could quite possibly get me into trouble. I told him that what I had said actually amounted to insurrection, even though I had not used the word, to which he made the diplomatic reply that he would not report what I meant but what I had said, and he was sure his superiors would not take exception to it. Well, there may have been something in that, but I did not like the diversion he had created. It would be talked about next day and what I had said would get secondary consideration, I was sure. However, they got my passport and sent it back to me. The French had stamped across one page that I was undesirable. On my return, I sent it to the foreign office and got a new one. But no sooner had it arrived than I was invited back to Germany. A crisis of the first magnitude was working up to a head and as the key to the situation was in Saxony, I was booked up to speak at a series of meetings there. When I got to Berlin, I found the party faced with the responsibility of carrying through a revolution, the crisis having taken such a rapid turn. In Saxony, a united front government of socialists and communists had been elected and proposals were being put forward for drastic changes to the advantage of the working class. On my arrival in Berlin, I was informed that the Reich government, goaded by the British and American imperialists by their own junkers, was contemplating action to suppress the Saxon government. This had sharply raised the question of a general strike. Such action would certainly have called for the overthrow of the Reich government. Conscious of this, I went off to Saxony with a grand young German comrade, Fritz Heckert, a leader of the Saxon miners. Medium tall, with a full, fresh complexion face, a fine head and hair, and fair, sun-bleached hair, he was the ideal companion for such a campaign. I had a truly grand time among the miners of Saxony. Being with them made me feel I was back in Lanarkshire or Fife. In Berlin, and on the train travelling south, I had heard much talk about the pending revolution and the changes that were hoped for when the communists took power. It was expected, and certainly among the miners in Saxony, who were standing by, as it were, ready to take the field. Away in the north too, in the Hamburg area, the word had gone out to prepare for action. Then the die was cast. The Reich government dispatched General Mueller with a Reich army, to suppress the United Front government. An emergency conference was called by the Saxon government, the Communist Party and the Socialist Party for Sunday, October 24th, in Chemnitz, an important industrial centre. I was invited as a fraternal delegate. There was a tense atmosphere as the delegates mustered that morning in Chemnitz. Around the hall were large numbers of armed proletarian guards, 
Outside the sky was blue, with the sun shining high in the heavens. Inside the banners and slogans raised the hopes of many of the delegates, up towards the blue sky and the glorious sun of a new day about to be born. There were three communists in the United Front government, and one of these occupied the chair. He made a short opening speech, in which he said that it was intended to submit a decisive resolution, which he hoped would be unanimously accepted by the delegates. But first there would be a report of how the present situation had developed, and the efforts that had been made to come to an understanding with the Reich government. This report was made by a socialist member of the government. It took up quite a long part of the forenoon and raised quite a number of questions, all of which, considering what transpired, seemed to have been arranged beforehand. There was a short break for a snack and for consultation among the leading socialists. When the conference assembled again, the leader of the German Socialist Party made a well-prepared conciliatory speech in which he drew attention to the dangers that confronted them in all Germany and suggested another effort before it was too late to get a negotiated understanding. As there was a majority of socialist delegates, this seemed to me extremely serious. I asked Fritz Heckert what had happened to Brandler and Fallheimer, the leaders of the Communist Party, and he told me they were in a room upstairs preparing a manifesto. I made my way up to them and got a cheery greeting. Brandler was a heavy-built working man with a very short neck that gave the impression of his being slightly humped. Valheimer was a, an intellectual and looked at tall and distinguished. Another lad named Jacob something or other, who turned up in London years later as a Trotskyist, was with them. I asked him, why they were not down below. They were drawing up a very important manifesto, they replied, which would make a special appeal to the British workers. It was headed, Hands off free Germany. A great piece of work, no doubt, if it had ever seen the light of day. I told them there would be no free Germany unless they got below and took the conference out of the hands of the socialist capitulators. They tried to assure me that everything was all right when I knew from what I had heard and seen down below that everything was all wrong. I watched them until they got their momentous manifesto finished. Then we went below to find that the conference and the revolution was finished. Tragic it was. The workers all over Germany were waiting for the call that never came. Up north in Hamburg, they were so sure that a decision would be taken for a general strike that the leaders there had already issued the call and the next day the city was out. Meanwhile, the way was left wide open for Mueller through the last minute betrayal of the socialists aided and abetted by the futility of Brandler and Falheimer. I made a very critical report about these two party leaders but the very real indictment of their conduct came from the comrades at Hamburg. They are led by Ernst Feilmann, a big friendly docker the workers had fought alone, but had been overwhelmed by the forces of the Reich. From the discussions that followed, a new party leadership emerged, with Feilmann to the fore. Soon he was the outstanding leader of the German Communist Party. He was arrested in 1933, and murdered in prison by the Hitler-Himmler gang as the Red Army approached Berlin.